Welcome to the video for chapter 9.3, Growth in Plants. Okay, so before we really talk about growth, okay, it's worth our time to go back and think about what kinds of tissues we have in plants, okay? And the first kind is called dermal tissue. And dermal, okay, is just like your dermis, okay, which is a fancy pants word for skin. So if you think about your dermatologist, your skin doctor, okay, this kind of helps give a little insight into what the dermal tissue is. It's the outer coverings um, that are really there to protect the plant. So again, we're protecting against water loss, against pathogens, okay, against uh, herbaceous predators, okay, all kinds of things uh, that we need to protect against there. Then we have what's called ground tissue, okay? And I'm gonna wait and talk about ground tissue for just a second, okay? Because it's kind of like the leftover tissue. The one that you're probably most familiar with is actually the vascular tissue. And the vascular tissue is of course the xylem and the phloem, which we've talked about in previous chapters. So we have the very outside of the plant. We have the stuff that carries stuff through the plant. Ground tissue is basically everything else, okay? So these are cells that have functions related to storage, photosynthesis, okay, support, secretion, okay? Pretty much anything except for that outer layer and except for the tubes that carry stuff through the plant. Now, it doesn't matter what type of tissue we're talking about, okay? All tissues originate from a type of plant tissue called a meristematic tissue. Okay, and this comes from the word meristem, which we'll talk about a lot later. Okay, but I usually think of this root word here, stem, because these are exactly like human stem cells. Okay, so human stem cells are undifferentiated cells that originate in the embryo, and they can specialize or differentiate into many different types of tissues. Plants have very similar cells. They're just not called stem cells. They're called meristem tissue or meristematic tissue. Okay, and again, they're undifferentiated and they can specialize into all the other types of plant tissues. Okay, so let's take a look at what this might look like in a plant. Okay, so here I've got a group of meristematic cells. So here is my meristem tissue. Okay, tissue being a group of cells with a similar function. Okay, and we're gonna find that through cell division, one of two things happens. So both of these represent cell division. Some of these meristem cells are going to copy themselves and divide via mitosis to become other meristem cells. Okay, so these guys have to regenerate, so they're gonna copy and divide to make other meristem cells, so making more undifferentiated cells. Another opportunity, though, for cell differentiated comes through this process. So again, through cell division, I'm gonna get some more unspecialized cells. Okay, but here, we have a process of differentiating, okay? So these cells are gonna go through the process of differentiation, okay? You may also hear that uh, referred to as specialization, same thing, okay? And these are gonna become our three types of tissues, okay? So we have dermal tissues, the outer covering, we have ground tissues, photosynthesis, storage, secretion, etc. Okay, and we have vascular tissues. Okay, so again, these meristem cells, okay, constantly regenerate to make more meristem cells, but they also can differentiate into the three types of plant tissue. Now, Growth in plants is going to look a lot different, okay, than growth in animals. Okay, so humans are an example of an animal, and we have what's called determinate growth, okay? That means that growth is eventually going to stop after a certain size has been reached, okay? So once you're done growing, you're done, okay? There, you're eventually going to stop, okay, at the beginning of adulthood, 
And of course, this is determined by genetics, nutrition, um, all kinds of things, environment, stuff like that. Okay, but our growth eventually reaches an end point. Plants, on the other hand, have what is called indeterminate growth. Okay, they continue to grow throughout their lifetime. Now, can we artificially make a plant stop growing? Yeah, we can do that, okay? But left to their own devices, plants are going to continue to grow throughout their lives. Uh, be careful, that doesn't necessarily mean a dramatic increase in height. It could also mean an increase in diameter. Okay, growth can mean a lot of different things. Okay, and death is also very different in plants and animals, okay? So animals um, often die determined by their inability to acquire resources or evade predators, okay? We're talking about uh, animals in the wild, of course. Um, can animals um, be invaded by a pathogen and die? Of course, okay? So, but none of these are predetermined, okay? So that's kind of the point that I'm getting at here. It's really something Something in the environment, okay, that determines when animals die. Plants, on the other hand, uh, their death is determined by their life cycle. So they have a set time to die. And there are three basic types of plant life cycles, okay? So we have what's called annuals, okay? And annuals are things like these peonies here. And they complete their life cycle in one year and then die, okay? They've grown, they've reproduced, they've done what they need to do, and then they die one year. That's it, okay? We have biennials, okay? That prefix bi meaning two, okay? These are things like these cabbage plants here. They take two years to complete their life cycle and then they die. And then we have things called perennials, like these begonias, Okay, and perennials can live for many years while completing their life cycle. Um, these are more like animals in the sense that they uh, usually only die due to some kind of environmental factor, that there's not a set time for them to die. Um, but these other plants, okay, definitely have a determined, definite life cycle. Okay, now growth is going to originate in those tissues called the meristems, okay? Those cells that are like stem cells and can become other types of tissues, okay? In plants, we have two types of meristems, the apical and the lateral meristem. The apical meristems are going to occur at the very top and the very bottom of plants, okay? So in a plant, it's going to be up here where the plant is growing upwards and at the tips of the roots, okay, where the plant is growing downwards, okay? So here we're talking up and down growth, okay? Growing taller above the soil and then extending the roots to reach farther down into the soil, this is what we call primary growth, okay? Growing up and down, growing tall. This results in soft tissue, okay? So these meristematic tissues, I'm thinking particularly of these um, shoot meristems here, are very soft tissue, okay? We're not talking about woody parts of stems. That's a different type of thing, okay? These are soft, non-woody stems. Um, a lot of times, these are really nice to eat. They're new, they're fresh, they're very tender, okay? New growth. And again, these come from the apical meristems. In the apical meristem, we would expect to see a lot of cells undergoing mitosis, okay? Growth means adding new cells, okay? So we would typically find quite a few cells in the active stages of cell division here. Okay, so we know that plants can grow up and down, okay? But they can also grow larger in diameter. And that growth comes from the lateral meristem. Okay, so this is gonna occur in both the roots and the stems, and it's responsible for secondary growth, and that means that it's growing larger in diameter. Okay, so I think of this kind of about like people. So when you were a baby, okay, you first experienced primary growth, okay, growing up, growing taller, 
And then once you're full grown and you start taking really difficult classes and they're really hard and you eat a lot of pizza because you're stressed out, okay, now you're going to start experiencing secondary growth, okay, growing larger in diameter. Plants are the same thing. Okay, so their lateral meristems are going to be found around the stems and around the roots because those things are growing bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, okay, in diameter. We've got two types of lateral meristems, okay? The first one being the vascular cambium. Okay, it's going to produce more vascular bundles, okay? And remember that those vascular bundles, particularly those lignified walls of the xylem, um, are a major component of wood. And then we have the cork cambium, and that occurs within the bark, and it produces the cork cells. So let's take a look at what that might look like. I'm going to do a terrible drawing of a tree. Okay, so again, if I were to cut a tree in half and take a cross section, I would be looking at pretty much a round piece of wood, okay? And the outermost layer is, of course, the bark. And then right inside of there, I have this layer of cork cambium, okay? So it's like right inside of there. Um, Cork cambium is where we get corks for like wine uh, and other things that you shouldn't be drinking. Um, and of course, the cork on different trees is going to have different properties, different thickness, etc. So winemakers are actually pretty particular about which ones they use. All right. So again, right inside of there, we have the cork cambium. Okay, uh, and I asked you if you're doing my notes right now to annotate with the descriptions and functions, but if you just you already wrote that because we just had it on uh, a previous slide a couple seconds ago, you don't need to do that again. That would be dumb, okay? And then right inside of there, all right, here's where we have our vascular cambium. Okay, so all in here, and you don't need to draw this part, but all in here would be some vascular bundles. Okay, and remember those are going to um, carry things, you know, xylem phloem, those lignified walls com comprise a lot of the wood. Again, we've previously talked about tree girdling where you can actually remove this layer and it will kill the tree. Okay, stuff like that. But important thing to remember is the location here. Okay, the cork cambium is closer to the outside, the vascular cambium closer to the inside, but they are both lateral meristems, both of them, okay, are responsible for growing out larger in diameter. Okay, now, would you believe me if I told you that this giant tree and this really small tree are actually the same species of tree? Well, if you don't believe me, you should just stop now. These videos are pointless if you don't believe anything I say. If you do believe me and you want to continue on, great. You're wonderful. There are a couple of things that could influence plant growth. So why is the same species of tree this little or this big? Well, first of all, environmental factors play a huge role in plant growth, and that can include day length. And when I say day length, I understand all days are 24 hours. When we say day length, we really mean the hours of sunlight, okay? So that could change with the seasons. It could change in your distance from the equator, lots of things. Uh, water availability, hey, that can influence growth as well. Plants also have receptors, Okay, and the receptors, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, actually I think that's in a future chapter, those are gonna help the plant to recognize those environmental factors. Of course, genetics are going to play a role, okay, and that's going to vary within plant species, but also within a species, you're gonna have some genetic variation uh, in terms of the ability to grow uh, quickly or at different speeds. And then we've got hormones, okay? And so hormones are definitely going to affect plant growth uh, just as hormones in humans would affect human growth. 
So speaking of hormones, okay, now's a good time to kind of go back and review um, some things regarding membrane proteins because hormone action is one of these. So remember, for my membrane proteins, I've got six major functions, okay, one of them being junctions. So these can bind cells together. Of course, they can act as enzymes. They can help with transport, and that can be both pumps for active transport or channels for passive transport. We can use these uh, membrane proteins for recognition specifically like those glycoproteins, okay? Um, or when we get into the immune system, we're talking about antigens, okay? Those proteins that are on the membrane are good for cell recognition. We have anchorage, either, either to the cytoskeleton on the inside or uh, to the extracellular matrix on the outside, so how cells kind of stick to things. And then we have transduction, okay? which is really hormone binding. And this is the one we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about today, okay? So how do hormones and plants interact? All right, well, let's talk about how these hormones originate and get transported throughout the plant to begin with. All right, so first of all, those protein receptors on specific plant cells receive a stimulus from the environment, okay? This could be light, uh, it could be a variety of things, okay? So a protein receptor on a plant cell gets some kind of a stimulus. Then it becomes activated, okay? So this stimulus causes the receptor to become activated. That activated receptor initiates a metabolic pathway. Okay, so it starts to turn on some kind of metabolic reaction that wasn't turned on before. This metabolic pathway produces a hormone. I'll show you how that works in just a second. And then we already know that hormones travel through the phloem. Okay, so we're talking about from source to sink. So wherever it is that we're making the hormone to wherever it needs to go. That's all going to go through the phloem. Okay, so here's what that looks like here. Let's say our stimulus is light, okay? Light can cause one of those receptor, or receptor proteins on the cell membrane to become activated. That activation can initiate a metabolic pathway. That metabolic pathway tells a gene to turn on, okay? It becomes activated. So if you've already been through the chapter on nucleic acids, you know all about transcription factors, okay, and how those promoters um, become activated there. So once that becomes activated, then that specific gene is transcribed, turned into mRNA, and translated on the ribosome and becomes some kind of a protein itself. So here in this case, okay, that protein would be a hormone, all right? But it was kind of a long journey to get to that hormone. So again, a stimulus activates some kind of a receptor protein, which initiates a metabolic reaction. That metabolic reaction results in the transcription and translation of a gene. That results in a hormone protein. And now we're ready for that hormone to flow through the phloem to wherever it is it's going. Now, Hormones in animals don't work the same way as in plants. So you're probably more familiar with animal hormones. Let's talk about them first. So in animals, uh, a specialized cell, so here we're talking about endocrine cells, okay, the specialized cell, uh, or gland produces a hormone that has specific target cells and elicits a specific response. Each desired response needs its own hormone, okay? So, for example, okay, in women's brains, okay, they have a gland called the pituitary gland. We'll learn all about those later on. And one of the hormones um, that's produced there is called oxytocin. 
And oxytocin does a whole lot of things, but one of the things that it does is it causes um, the ejection of milk, okay, from the milk secreting cells of the breast. So if we need milk, okay, then we need a specific hormone from a specific gland, okay, and it has a specific result. Do you notice that I keep saying the word specific a lot? Okay, if not, then you probably have me on mute, and if that's the case, then boo-hoo. All right, plants, not so much, okay? Plants have a totally different, uh, more like hippy-dippy, trippy version of hormone action. Here, okay, many cells are going to produce the same hormone, so it's not like a specialized cell, like in animals. And that hormone can have many different effects depending on the location of the receptor cell. So if the hormone goes one place, it might do one thing. If it goes another place, it might do another. We can also uh, get a res desired result, but it may take many hormones interacting together to get that result. So just like you might mix a bunch of pink colors together to get the exact shade that you want, okay, hormones in plants can often work the same way. So definitely not as specific as animal hormones. Now, hormones in plants play a vital role in a phenomenon called tropism, okay? And tropism is growth or movement in response to an environmental stimuli. So we have things such as gravitational tropism, where the plant can sense that it's pointing downwards and will actually begin to grow upwards. So it'll kind of write its uh, growth pattern. It can respond to touch, light, etc. Growth in response to light is what we call phototropism, okay? So that keyword photo should have given that away. So this is when plants can actually direct their movement or growth in a particular direction to maximize their exposure to light. And it's super important for plants to be able to do this, okay? So it's a competitive world out there, right? On a forest floor where I might have thousands of seeds, okay, those plants need to be able to grow quickly and towards the light. So they are competing with their neighbors, okay, for these light sources. It's important for them to be able to maximize their exposure to light so that they can photosynthesize more, so that they can build more cells, so that they can continue to grow, okay? It's very important that they get that proper light exposure. Okay, so how do they do this? Well, plants are going to use a hormone called auxin. It's the only named hormone in plants that you need to know. All right, so auxin is generally evenly distributed in all of a plant's cells. In order to bend towards the light, okay, so I want a plant that's able to bend towards the light, okay, Auxin is going to need to get actively pumped, so using a protein pump, using ATP, out of the cells that are closest to the light source. Okay, so if here is the shoot of my plant, auxin is normally evenly distributed. Okay, if I want to bend away, or sorry, if I want to bend towards the light, like if the light is on this side, then all of the auxin needs to come over here to the cells that are farthest from the light. Because I am pumping things um, from a low concentration gradient to a high concentration gradient, I'm going against the concentration gradient, that's going to require active transport, which means I'm going to need a protein pump and ATP. Okay, so that auxin is going to start to accumulate in the space between the cells. Once we have that accumulation, okay, in the space between the cells, uh, that high concentration gradient is going to allow the auxin to actually diffuse into the cells that are farthest from the light. So that part's passive, okay, the initial getting them out of the cells that are closest to the light and into the space between, that part is active, okay. But now we have an accumulation right next to these cells that are farthest from the light. And in order to even out that concentration gradient, some of that auxin is going to passively diffuse 
into the cells that are farther from the light. That increase in auxin level is going to activate genes, okay, that code for a specific enzyme. The enzyme causes the cell walls of the cells farthest from the light to elongate or become longer. And then once this elongation happens, okay, that's going to cause the plant to bend towards the light, okay? So if you can imagine standing flat on both feet and then just standing up on your tippy toes on one side, okay, that's going to cause you to bend to one side, and uh, that's exactly what's going on here. Okay, so let's give this a try drawing this. Let's say I have a plant shoot, okay? And inside that plant shoot, I have all these auxin molecules that are evenly distributed, okay? So this red stuff here is auxin. All right, now let's say that due to a changing environmental factor or a different placement of the plant, okay, that the light is on one side. It would benefit the plant if it could lean towards this side to maximize the exposure to the light. So what's going to happen is that all of the auxin molecules are going to be pumped to the side of the plant that is farthest from the light. Okay, so they're going to be pumped okay, out of the cells. They're going to accumulate in the space between the cells. They're going to diffuse into the cells, all that jazz. But the key here is, is that they are away from the light. And so that's going to cause these cell walls to elongate, but not these cell walls, okay? So then that's going to look something like this, okay, where this side that's away from the light becomes longer, but not the other side, okay? And that's what we call phototropism. Let's see how good a job I did at uh, drawing that here. Hopefully your drawing looks something like this. Okay, notice over here these elongated cell balls. All right, now auxin also does some other cool things in plants. Remember that plant hormones are different than animal hormones um, in the fact that they may have different functions depending on the different target tissues. Okay, so auxin can do different things in different parts of the plant. So we already know that it's involved in phototropism. It can also stimulate uh, mitosis in our meristematic tissue, okay, so thereby encouraging some growth. It can cause differentiation in some of those meristematic tissues, okay, like the xylem or the phloem. Okay, it can cause the development of roots and also the stimulation and growth of flower parts. So again, that one hormone can do lots of different things there. Now, regardless of what kind of target tissue we're talking about or what kind of function, auxin is very close to uh, gene regulation, which you probably learned about in another chapter, okay? So when we say gene regulation, you of course know that within your DNA, you have short sections that um, scribe for a specific protein, and those sections of DNA are called genes, and sometimes they're turned on and sometimes they're turned off, okay, or activated and deactivated. Auxin is a molecule that works much like most hormones, okay, that can regulate whether or not that gene is transcribed and translated. Okay, now the last little bit that we're going to talk about here uh, in this chapter is something called micropropagation, okay? So again, micro meaning small, okay? Propagate, we're talking about growing things. So here we're taking small plant parts and using them to grow uh, larger plants. So this is where we're going to take the cells from the shoot apex, okay? That's our apical meristem, the one responsible for primary growth, which is up and down. Okay, and so we're just going to take a few cells from that and we're going to allow those cells to kind of replicate, 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 replicate. Okay, and then we're actually going to kind of like separate those cell tissues and we're going to direct their development uh, into individual plants. So from a single bunch of meristematic cells... Okay, I can separate them and let them allow, or allow them to replicate and differentiate 
into multiple individuals. Um, something really important in terms of uh, sustaining the population of endangered plants. So if I only have one of these endangered plants, I can kind of use it to make many individuals of that same species. Uh, pretty cool stuff there. And that'll do it for chapter 9.3 on plant growth.